Hey guys, Dennis here, and we're back with another brand new episode of Collider Games, uh, the podcast uh, version. I'm here today with Joey Rasul. How you guys doing? And today we're going to talk about uh, what's been going on in video games, what you've been doing, you know, what games you've been playing. I know you've been playing a certain game. Are we that allowed to talk I'm about it? I'm not allowed to talk about You're yet. You're not allowed to talk about a big game that, that people find very interesting on our channel. Yes. Okay. I think... Well, when, I, when is the... When can you talk about this I, game? Monday, I can talk about it. Okay, this this coming Monday. Mo Monday, I can say that I have it. Okay, all right. And so. I can't actually really talk about it until like the 4th. Uh, but when the 4th happens, there'll be reviews and there'll be videos. And uh, once the game finally releases, there's going to be all kinds of cool content. Okay. Um, are, are you playing anything else besides that? Um, I'm trying to actually, you know, one of the things that I started to get back into, um, because we've been looking into, uh, doing some Twitch streaming yeah. here. Um, we, I've been looking into a game that I could play on my computer that wasn't an FPS that didn't require a lot of like low latency. Mm -hmm. and I've been playing a lot of Hearthstone again. Okay. And especially because after that conversation with Fernandez getting into like, cause he's playing battle for Azeroth. Like hearing the lore again of mm -hmm. uh, of World of Warcraft, I was like, "Darn it, I want to get back into it." So I st I picked up uh, like my old priest deck, which uh, you know, looking through the meta, like my old strategy will not get you past uh, you know twentieth uh, rank or anything like that anymore. But I still play it and I'm still having fun, and uh, I'm I don't think I've ever gotten a twentieth rank anyway. So um yeah it's um they they just had their global games uh so i was paying attention a little bit to mm -hmm. that uh with hearthstone they're, they're still going on technically uh as we're recording this um but uh yeah so i've been looking into you know some of the new cards and the new metas uh within hearthstone and a lot of it still kind of goes over my head but i'm picking up on it more than most esports mm -hmm. um this is the thing like with any sport you can start watching it and not not understand anything, but the second you start to understand the rules, it gets a lot more entertaining. So if yeah. you jump in with a game that you already know, then you start to pick up on it and see patterns mm -hmm. earlier, uh, and that's starting to be really good. And I have to say, like the um, the announcers for um, the global games uh, were were really good. You know, like they were really good at explaining uh, some of the things that they were expecting. Uh, and, and what the strategy might be mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that was always interesting. Yeah, speaking of Battle for Azeroth, uh, I know you and, and Fernandez did a kind of a podcast review yeah. discussion video last week. Uh, yeah, they reported that they sold 3.4 million units. Uh, interesting. In, I think, the first day, just the first day. Oh, of wow. World okay. of Warcraft expansion. Does that include um, pre-orders, or is that, you know, that's just uh, it, yeah, it's just day I, one download day kinda. One, I don't know if that includes pre orders, but they said it's like the fastest selling uh expansion for World And of honestly, Warcraft. the the thing about World of Warcraft, um, the marketing can hook people so easily and so well. Blizzard in general, you know, those the cinematics that they can put out, like yeah. that will hook you in so quickly and you know we just saw it happen with uh overwatch again you know they mm -hmm. they released uh a cinematic uh one of their shorts yeah which um, we'll talk about a little during later. gamescom yeah they like blizzard cinematics are just amazing yeah They've i remember the two cinematics that impressed me always the most were blizzards and then when they were doing the old knights of knights of the old republic right okay like those, yeah, yeah, yeah those were always fantastic um, so speaking of Gamescom, uh, which is happening right now in yeah. Germany, which is kind of like the E3 of Europe. It's like the biggest yeah. video game convention over there. A lot of, you know, developers and studios go there and show off mm -hmm. their games. Anything in particular that they're showing? I mean, there's nothing. I don't think they ever launch anything as big like something like E3, but yeah. they do show a lot of footage of games that you are looking forward to. What, what are you? What's kind of stood out for you? Well, so for me, the biggest thing, uh, the thing that was the biggest question mark uh, was Life is Strange 2. Mm -hmm. um, and so much so that, like, you know, when I played Life is Strange 1 and they announced the second one, I was like, great, I'm interested to see where they're going to go with this story. How can they continue it? And they said, they're not going to continue it. They're doing a second one in an anthology. And then I played Captain Spirit um, after E3 that was this... Um, 
that was supposed to be like a prequel to uh, Life is Strange 2. And I was like, great, okay, now I know Captain Spirit. I'm really excited for Life is Strange 2 because I like the concept of this like young superhero. Uh, and then I saw the trailer for Life is Strange 2 and I was so fixated on the idea of Captain Spirit like being mm. the main character that when I saw this trailer, I just... I didn't know how to process this at, at first because it's a completely different story following mm. the Diaz brothers um, after you know some tragic event. Um, and it took me a second. Like I watched it a couple times and then I really started to like tear apart the trailer and find all the little hints to the story. Um, and so there's actually a video on our channel right now that is the, a trailer breakdown uh, in which like I went through frame by frame just to find the story of the Diaz brothers and like what happens with their father and all that. And like that information is in the trailer. They, you know, don't nod was, and Square Enix were very specific about what they put in the trailer mm -hmm. and what they didn't. And like, you can see moments where it cuts a frame before you would see something. And you can see moments where it's like, if you, if you pause on this frame, you will get a lot of information. And so uh, there's a video on our channel to break that down if you want to check it out. If you don't want Life is Strange 2 spoiled for you, then, you know, don't watch it. But honestly, I don't think it's going to be big spoilers. The biggest thing for me was that uh, Captain Spirit, uh, Chris, is not in that trailer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the story of the two brothers. But we know that at some point they meet each other. Uh, and I'm wondering where in the story that's going to be. Because it's an episodic story. Mm -hmm. Every episode's going to end on a cliffhanger. That's just how they all work. Yeah. Um, so maybe around the end of that, like episode two, we'll see Chris. Or maybe the story takes place entirely before they meet Chris mm -hmm. and they don't see Chris until end of episode four and then episode five is with uh, Chris. Um, or honestly, like the way they looked in Captain Spirit, they look like happy and healthy and normal. And it's only like two months of time so maybe the entire game of life is strange 2 because the first one took place within a week mm -hmm. maybe the entire game of life is strange 2 takes place before they even meet chris and captain spirit's not even part of life is strange 2 mm -hmm. which i don't know that that would be a little disappointing to me um but that's definitely something they could do there are mm -hmm. a lot of theories going around there's like it's a weird cool kind of universe that they've built with life is strange mm -hmm. so there's plenty of theories going around anything else you, you saw um yeah i mean there's there's quite a few things that uh that i want to check out now ultimately uh gamescom like you said there are some new updates and mm -hmm. things like that but there's uh for the most part it's um it's not a huge game announcements right? it's like well, like red dead redemption isn't going to be like hey here here no but it's for the like the eu press that yeah. that weren't able to be at e3 yes. that's that's a big portion of it i know devolver uh, announced something cool mm -hmm. they, they have a game called reigns which is yes. if you've ever wanted to choose your own adventure game to be simpler and not have to work like this is almost a card based choose your own adventure game like app based you can play it really simply on your phone um, and they announced a partnership with HBO to do a Game of Thrones yeah, version of it. Yeah, I saw the trailer. It. Right that, there. like, it's such a simple concept of a game. It goes back to, like, text-based gaming. Yeah. Um, you know, like, back to back to the days of, like, you know, you know, choo choosing paths mm -hmm. and things like that uh, through text. Um, and it looks, you know, it, the art style is still yeah, it's really a pretty. cartoonish art yeah. style. I saw the trailer. I, you know, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan, so I'm gonna definitely uh, yeah. check this out. But that was a that was a surprise this this morning. Yeah. Uh, check, seeing that one one that I want to look into that I haven't had a chance to really like investigate uh, is a game called Breach, mm -hmm. um, which just got announced. Um, I don't know much about it. Um, it is an RPG. Uh, and it has uh, ex developers from um, from Bioware, mm -hmm. um, so that that's as much as I know about it. I know like by the time this episode comes out, I'll have a lot more <laughs> information. So I'm sorry, everyone in the comments who's like, no, I know exactly what this game yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. But that's one that I'm looking into uh, investigating more and following with Collider Games. Mm -hmm. So if you guys in the comments want to see more of Breach uh, as news develops, let us know. Yeah, uh, one thing that stood out to me, it, it's a game I wasn't familiar with, but I saw the trailer. They had like a, 
think 16 minute kind of gameplay trailer uncut called uh, a plague tale innocence by yes. a, a solvo studio and it's it's weird it's set in like the 14th century in in france and it's like i think i think it's about like a sister and she's like trying to help her mm -hmm. brothers i think like uh, survive yeah her it's uh, her young uh Amik Misha and her little brother Hugo, and they're like trying to survive in this plague-ridden yeah. world. And it, it, it's interesting because you know it's like a third person, but it's like a adventure action stealth. Yeah, game. it's weird because it, people have been dubbing it, it's like the rat game or something. Because like yeah. a lot of the stuff is like you're trying to avoid all these plague-infested rats that are coming <laughs> at you, and you see a lot of yeah. things. It's, it's felt felt kind of like dishonored without powers yeah so but it felt cinematic it felt like yeah. i was watching like a, either a movie or a television show that's uh, the thing i feel like games are getting like more cinematic and also more contemplative mm -hmm. on things like we're starting to get into this era of like the art game yeah uh or you know we've had the art game before but they've been niche and they've been indie and now we can have uh you know, like the equivalent of, you know, like you have your blockbuster movies and you have your Academy Award yeah. uh, aspiring movies. We're starting to get into that world where the AAA games are the blockbusters. Mm -hmm. They're the best sellers. But now we're starting to get, you know, more thought provoking stuff mm -hmm. that people maybe aren't going to pick up as much of. They're going to forget about it quicker. But it's going to be about exploring what the art form can do and pushing a more you know a, a story with less less like grittiness mm -hmm. and less you know guns blazing and and more of a story that you would have seen on tv or in movies yeah yeah i mean this definitely looks like something especially with video games nowadays you know longer ones that are mm -hmm. like 20 30 40 you know something yeah. like fallout you know 80 to 100 hours plus like that's like a you know more like a season of television or, or yeah. whatnot and, and they kind of sink you into that world and, and this one they, they call as a dark medieval mystery and it's like i'm interested in this game i like the look of it i like the atmosphere obviously i'm going to still be on the lookout and see like okay how is this game progressing is it really gonna i think the only concern i have is 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 the gameplay going to be varied enough or the story engaging enough where I don't care and I'll just keep playing. playing. Right, right. Um, oh, so the other thing that did jump out to me, um, because I know a lot of people are not, a, not big fans of Destiny 2. They mm -hmm. haven't been playing it as much. I love it because, I mean, I'll watch Nathan Fillion in just about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's one of the few places where you can have multiplayer uh, co-op uh, across, like across, um, you know, like be, being able to play with your friends and doing like multiplayer co-op yeah. missions and having that consistent and not just something that was tacked on to a mm -hmm. game, um, and and not uh competitive, uh necessarily. Like yeah. there there is you know PVP, yeah. but you can do you can go out and do missions with friends and you can go do raids and things like that um on console. And so Destiny Two is one of the few places that you can do that. Um, so even if you're not a like even if the game is not perfect, mm -hmm. which is not, um, if you have a couple friends that play it and you know you play it together, it makes the game so oh, much better. Co-op co can do a lot. Co-op of, like, can save a game. <laughs> like I think we talked. Didn't we? I can't remember. Did we have a discussion about like games that we love that like no one else? Yeah, loved and like or whatever. Ultimately, like, like there, there was a game I remember I played. Uh, it was the conflict series. It was like conflict, uh, like okay. Desert Storm conflict. It was, and it's not like a well. It, just think of like a low budget, like SOCOM, right? Yeah, it's like a third person like shooter. But it, because I played it with my friends, yeah, on co op, it was so much more fun. Even though the gun, the game fundamentally, if I played, probably played it by myself, probably would it would have been okay. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things that got me into like the Battlefield uh, series is because that the way that that multiplayer worked, even if you weren't playing with friends, you kind of felt like you were uh -huh. because because of the way that like you know team mechanics worked. Mm -hmm. But so with Destiny, they released uh, a new uh, cinematic trailer uh, called uh, "Last Stand of the Gunslinger," mm -hmm. um, which they they've already talked about the fact that Kate is going to die. Mm -hmm. They've 
shown Cade dying. Uh, and this was the like the cinematic for the moments before that, like just his last hurrah, his badassness, his like Nathan Villian being the quippy guy he is, and basically Nathan Villian being an action hero and not having to physically do any of the action. You know, all the problems that I had with uh, with him being uh, Nathan Drake now, mm-hmm. because you know, like fifteen years ago, that would have been an amazing decision, mm-hmm. but. If he's doing it in a video game and being that same snarky, quippy action hero, mm-hmm. then he can do it to the end of time. I'm f- totally fine with that. In fact, you know, if if there comes a day where Nolan North doesn't want to do Nathan Drake anymore mm-hmm. and like they want to revamp the series, they they want to reboot it or something like that, and they cast Nathan Fillion as the voice, mm-hmm. that's that development is probably too far along and maybe even then it's like, okay, you, you're starting to sound old yeah. now, but like, that's the kind of thing I feel like Nathan Fillion is just, is, is just like too far behind where everything needs to be to, to fall into place with this. I mean, I love the guy and I love the characters that he plays, but I just, I don't ever see it lining up. Yeah. I remember him from uh, Halo ODST. Yes. He, he played uh, one of the main characters. Was it the main character or one of the main characters? It was characters? One, one of the main. It, it, it wasn't your character, but it was like your sergeant. Yeah. Um, I remember playing that opening, like playing ODST, having that o- opening cinematic going. Um, and my uh, wife and I had, you know, been binging Netflix and watching mm-hmm. through Firefly and stuff like that. And I was like, I'm going to play video games. So she walked out of the room mm-hmm. and I was playing ODST. And she came back in because she thought it was another episode of Firefly. Like you were like sneak watching yeah. an episode it was like, without this her. This is a secret episode that you've never heard of. I'm like, no, this is Halo ODST. Yeah. Which is kind of Firefly to a certain extent. <laughs> if you're like, you know, if you've got blinders on for Nathan Fillion, <laughs> which sometimes I do. Um, other games that stood out, they, they showed a lot of footage from uh, Devil May Cry 5. Mm. Uh also, Sakura Shadows Die Twice, yes. which you know is from the developers of uh, Dark Souls. Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminded me of you know they had that Ninja Gaiden game. I remember yeah. it was like really hard. I think it came out on Xbox. It was I really like that game. It was I'm, I'm super hard though. And, I'm in, and supposedly this is like super super hard. I'm game. interested to see that. Uh, against Ghost of Tsushima. Okay, yeah. Uh, because... When I first saw the, the clips, I was like, is that Ghost of Tsushima? And I was like, no, no. Because yeah. this, this is coming out on on uh, all, all the systems, Xbox, yeah. play, PlayStation, and whatnot. So, you know, I mean, I don't know what the release schedules are going to be like, if they're going to be similar. Obviously, the games are going to be different, but I'm interested to see how those two play against each other in, in the marketing, how people pick up uh, one or the other. Mm-hmm. Um Obviously, like th- we've seen this happen in movies all the time, you know, when two similar ideas go into development mm-hmm. uh, and they, they, they come out at the same time. Like we saw that with like the illusionist and the prestige. Yes. Uh, you know, it's it's happened quite a few times. Yeah. There uh, was uh, what was it? Uh, Deep Impact and Armageddon came out at the same time. Yeah. Like- so, you know, like to have that happening in move uh, in video games is is pretty interesting. Um I do think they are going to be different games. Uh, they're they're obviously going to be different games. Like Dark Souls, uh, as as a uh, style, mm-hmm. is is so different from what we saw from Ghost of Tsushima. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, when, in fact, after E three, when I was talking to people about Ghost of Tsushima, they thought I was talking about Shadows Die Twice, uh. and we had this back and forth of like, no, wait, wait. The game that's being made by the people from Dark Souls? Yeah, no. Wait, no. The game that's being made by the people who made Infamous. Wait, how is that the same? No, it's not. It's the same game. It's, it's okay. Yeah. It's like you can have two, two games that are set in the same world. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, Feudal Japan is not just yeah. for one game at a time. No. Uh, so one of the big announcements was from Ubisoft during Gamescom, mm-hmm. which was that there will not be Assassin's Creed game in 2019. Uh, I I stand by the fact that there's not going to be an Assassin's Creed game in 2018 because Odyssey doesn't look like an Assassin's Creed game. Okay, uh, well I mean, that, <laughs> that was standing. I mean, yeah. it is in the franchise. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, they released a, a new video showcasing the, the combat system where they have gotten rid of the blocking mm-hmm. and are going to focus on parrying and dodging. Yeah, instead. 
What are, what are your no, yeah, I was going to say, I'll let you finish because I, I have my issues with okay. that. Um, 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 well, in terms of the no new game in 2019, I think that's that's fine. I, you know, I mean, obviously, because Assassin's Creed is such a, a, a hit, they want to, like, release games every yeah. year, every year. But you just kind of get, and this happens in movies, too. Yeah. Or television shows where, like, when you start to do too much too fast yeah the time windows to like breathe and figure out what you're going to do start to to compact and you start to get like maybe lost or you know the quality of the product doesn't get it it looked like they spent a lot of time on because okay to your point odyssey doesn't look like assassin's creed game okay no so they really had to reinvent a lot of stuff for this game they wanted to make it more (laughs) rpg like obviously the environments look nothing like any assassin's creed game before the characters are different the storylines so they probably invested so much time in this game that yeah. they they don't you know to, to release another game next year unless it's going to copy this 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 storyline and engine or what whatnot yeah. it's it's just it's too fast so i i actually applaud that they're not releasing an assassin's creed game for 2019 they can figure out what they want to do for the next one to come out in 2020 or even 2021, I, you know, I don't need a game a, a, every year. Uh, as far as the combat system, yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting. Uh, what are your thoughts? So, if you were ever gonna take away <laughs> the idea of blocking mm-hmm. in an Assassin's Creed game, why is it when you have when you have Rome or Greece? Uh, Greece. Yeah, Greece. Yeah. Why is it when you have like Grecian uh uh like Grecian weaponry and when you actually have a shield in in any kind of context like when you look at every other um Assassin's Creed game mm-hmm. you had blocking and that was weapon blocking mm-hmm. because shields were not part of the assassin repertoire. Yeah. They just they just weren't. I mean, like occasionally, maybe you could find something that was, but it it didn't make sense in the world. In Greece, a shield makes perfect sense, and this is when you're taking it away. I get I get that. Like, ultimately, if you've always wanted to take it away, and now this was just the opportunity, and it's just bad timing. Yeah, it, I think there you should have take you should have taken it away in uh, Origins. <laughs> Like they should have. If you were gonna take away blocking, you uh-huh. should have taken it away in Origins, and then even then, this would be weird to not have the ability to use the dozen shields that are mm-hmm. obviously gonna be around. Yeah. And are you and are you telling me that the the system is gonna work both ways so that like NPCs uh, and aggressors can't block as well, and they're gonna be coming at you not holding shields? I guess. Or so. they're gonna be coming at you holding shields that they can't use. No, I mean, if they have shields, they're going to have to be able to use right. them. Right. But I think their thing is they wanted to get the combat more free-flowing uh, so there wasn't so much blocking. And then mm-hmm. secondly, they, the, the the way they're explaining it is that your character is, is not part of, like, a phalanx. It's not part of a, a you know, like a... Yeah. You're not really a soldier. You're, you're, you are a kind of a single assassin, solo assassin type yeah. of character. And so you wouldn't be carrying that shield... You know, Which, honestly, yeah, you would at least have one around. Maybe you wouldn't be carrying it on your person, but you'd have one like on your horse or or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But that's their explanation for there, it. There's so much cool combat that could have been done shield and spear. Mm-hmm. Like that could have been beautiful. Um, but I, you know what? The, the, the cool idea of all of... Uh, Greece fighting one way mm-hmm. and the assassin idea of fighting fighting a different way and getting around shields uh, and things like that, that could be interesting. Um, and so like we saw within that gameplay mechanic uh, video within uh, like within the combat stuff um, and through like screenshots and stuff, we saw that it is uh, fluid, yes, which is nice. Like I spent a lot of Assassin's Creed 1 sitting holding block and waiting. Um, so I get that they want to re- remove that as a mechanic from the story. It's just bad timing. I yeah, think. I'm looking at a picture right now, and I see an NPC that is that had a shield. Yeah. So it looks like you will be dodging. Uh, Which but- that that could be interesting. That can make sense if they're if they're working that into the story. Then I'm down. I just it's it's weird. Like you kill someone with a shield, but you don't take their shield. Yeah. Know? 
Well, I mean, if I guess if you want to be moving quickly and things like that, I'm yeah. coming around on it. Uh, right. You know, I'm right. I'm changing my own mind. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the proof is in the pudding, right? Yeah. We have to wait until the game comes out. We play it. We yeah. see how it feels. If I think they were concerned with people, too many people were just turtling up with yeah. the shield. Yeah, that makes like sense. When you get surrounded by enemies and what? Do you think? Do you think they beta tested uh, or or alpha tested with a shield and and just didn't? Maybe. Or, or maybe they Didn't just like it. just maybe they just heard too many complaints of of, of people. Of, yeah, just that was like all they did was just like turtle up with the shield. Well, especially when when movement is so fluid uh, in Assassin's Creed, then once you drop into combat and you're like yeah. sitting, holding, and waiting, I, I get that. And especially after you know we've seen what can be done in uh, things like. Um, in things like uh, Arkham, the Arkham games, yeah, yeah. as far as fluid combat, yeah, animations, uh, combat animations, yeah. Uh, if they, if they, so if maybe they, they want to go that that route. If they pushed a little more that route and and didn't have like the the heavy impact hits that mm-hmm. uh, that has, I I I could be I could swayed. be into that. You could be swayed. Uh, could be swayed. All right, another thing that came out and you mentioned earlier, Overwatch. Uh, they released. Uh, they're releasing a new map, uh, Busan, uh, Korea. Yeah. And they also released an animated show short called uh, "Shooting Star," focusing on the mecha pilot uh, Diva. 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 Ah, oh, that's right. Yes. Uh, AKA Hannah Song. Uh, I I personally ha- don't play Overwatch. I know you do. Yeah. What do you think about the announcement of the new map and the short? I watched the short, so we can talk about the short sure. next. But what, what about this new map? So the map is going to be a uh, control map. One of the things that I love about whenever they release new maps is that there's not story within the game. Mm-hmm. There, like, there really isn't, um, apart from like voice lines and stuff like that. But if you're looking around the maps, you can piece together story. You can get little bits of people's lives. So we saw um, the mecha base um, of Diva's team in the short and there's part of the map that is going to be based in there. So little things that you saw in the short, you're going to see around that map. You're going to piece together the story of, of Mm Hana. And, uh, we've had this for, we're for all the worlds, you know, when you first dropped into like Eichenwald and, and stuff like that, you saw the remnants of battle. You mm. saw that the Omnic War has been going on here, and this is a place that made a last stand. Um, for uh, Doomfist, in uh, I'm blanking on where which map it is. Uh, it's not Hollywood. Uh, but it's one where you start in like the train terminal, and there was always like someone crushed up against the wall that you're like, I know that was Doomfist. Mm -hmm. And so when Doomfist finally came into the game, everyone had this idea of like who he was and what he was going to be. The story, so the story's not in the game, but the story is so good and so fun in the shorts. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, you know, it feels like Pixar. It feels like it doesn't take long to hit you with some emotion like watching this short it, it, it felt like big hero six um i will say that this is not one of the stronger shorts mm-hmm. for me because they've done like six mm-hmm. or or eight now i think that um the bastion one will still always be the strongest for me because if i'm comparing it to uh pixar that was that was the entire film of wally in mm-hmm. five minutes uh, and it's it's so impressive what Blizzard can do on their story side of things, but you know, uh, and I I am not uh, a, a diva player, so I I always gravitate to towards the short of like a character that I I really played. Yeah. I'm still waiting on like a really good uh, like Farah and uh, Anna one. Like that would be that would be great. Um, but uh, yeah, so diva. You get to like see how she kind of built some of the uh, the attacks that she mm-hmm. has. You know, she she has the, def- the deflection matrix uh, that she uses in there. She's got the guns, obviously. She's got the the jets, and then w- like her ultimate has always been the self destruct mode. Mm-hmm. And this is basically seeing her use it for the first time in this short. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a really cool way that they like they take these things that are mechanics in the game. Uh, and they've been changing the meta of the game for a long time. Like 
there are characters that have completely different alts now than they did when they launched. Um, so seeing them weave even like people's attacks and stuff like that into a story uh, is mm-hmm. is always really entertaining to me. But you know what? You you are a movie reviewer as yeah. well as or and, and have been uh, with Collider. So I'd love to hear your thoughts outside of the yeah, Overwatch not world knowing, on this story. Not knowing the Overwatch world, it was a nice kind of side story where you could get into it and understand the character and the story without having a huge, you know, knowledge base mm-hmm. of what had happened before because this is kind of like a little thing about, oh, her her uh, persona that that's like... The celebrity. The celebrity that all the, the fans and the media know and then that there's her really like, you know, not living the glamorous and glitz yeah. life. She's just working, you know? Uh so I enjoyed it for that part. I mean, I have to watch yeah. the rest. Uh, to go off on a tangent here, and I don't know if you watched, did you see the trailer for Star Wars Resistance? Star Wars Resistance, which it's uh, the it's the new oh trailer yeah, yeah 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 the, Dis- the animated the Disney, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah sorry I was thinking I was thinking of a game I'm like how is there a Star Wars game no, in no, this? No. Um, so there was a debate, you know, over this this show. I mean, obviously there's a huge debate on whether or not people are interested in seeing it or whatnot. Yeah. But another side debate to that was, you know, we mentioned that it was anime inspired, and mm-hmm. you know, you get, uh, we had a lot of people complain and say, no, it's not. Um, something like this short that I see here, I feel like is anime inspired as well. Yeah. And the reason I bring this up is I actually feel like. The reason why there were so many arguments against it is that a lot of young people, I mean, now yeah. to be the old man, you know, sure, don't realize how Japanese anime has influenced American animation yeah. style because I grew up watching, you know, American cartoons and also watching Japanese cartoons, and there was a distinct difference. And if you wanted something like uh, a lot of the, the shows yeah. now, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, or, or just yeah. even some of the, what were these shows that are on TV in the, for kids in the morning or whatever, a lot of these things now have been influenced by Japanese animation, but I think maybe younger people don't realize that. The biggest thing to take away from the the influence of anime that that happened in the 90s um and and you know and before that, but I'm going to talk about the 90s cuz that's what I was exposed to. Um you know, when when I was watching there was there was Dragon Ball Z uh-huh. and Ed Ed Nettie that you could watch and like, hey, like what is Ed Ed Nettie? Ed Ed Nettie like Ed Ed Nettie Cow and Chicken uh all these like r- like goofy cartoons, like almost like Ren and Stimpy style animation, but but you know a okay. little more child appropriate. Okay, those were the two kinds of cartoons. Yeah. You had anime on Toonami, mm-hmm. and you had you know Ed Ed Nettie, Cow and Chicken, yeah. Cat Dog, things like that. So it was very easy to and like tell. Cat Dog is definitely like American. It was animation. very easy to tell the difference. SpongeBob, SpongeBob is yes. a good example. What happens when, you know, like you can't tell the art style apart is that you get m- more mature story storylines in anime. You get some goofy stuff as well, yeah. but they're dealing with more mature problems. If they're dealing it with it in a goofy way, that's one thing. That's still technically anime. Um, what it is, is these shows are starting to deal with more mature problems and... Most people who are creating shows in America got that inspiration from anime they watched when they were younger. So even if like the art style is not influenced by anime, even if the storylines aren't influenced by anime, the idea of doing of respecting your audience a little bit more comes from anime. So even if it's like a third generation inspiration, like they weren't inspired by anime, they were inspired by Avatar. Guess what? Avatar was inspired by anime. Well, that one's definitely inspired yes. by anime. I mean, yeah, because the the art style as well and all. I that. mean, the storylines. It's an Asian mm-hmm. influenced mm-hmm. storyline, and they, you know, they kind of use, you know, kind of an anime style with with yeah. the. I mean, it's it's animated uh, in. 
they had both a Korean and a Japanese studio do the animations yeah. for Avatar: The Last Airbender. But then you could you could look at I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a uh, animation tangent here, and I'm like I'm not an animation uh, specialist, but no, neither am I. But I mean, but I've could, watched enough and over the years of my life to know yeah. what originally was American animation, what originally was Japanese animation, and kind of like the influence now. Like I look at something like that Star Wars Resistance trailer, I'm like. That's anime yeah. inspired. It's not yeah. Japanese anime, but it's definitely has its and influences. And I think in I there. think back to uh, like even King, Kim Possible is uh, like anime inspired to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. And then you look at like American Dragon Jake Long, mm-hmm. who is it's like an Asian focused storyline, but it's not as anime inspired. Mm-hmm. It's more Western animation. Mm-hmm. It's more like Western uh, storylines. But it's still an Asian uh, influenced uh, like world and character, so you can have anime stories about Western uh, stuff, and you can have Western storylines about uh, Eastern stuff. That is always available, but I think it's harder to palette sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like Jackie Chan Adventures, kind of had to have the animation yeah. style that it did. Because it was going to be a Jackie Chan adventure yeah, storyline, and yes. it was going to be dealing with like Tao magic and stuff like that. So it's like you kind of have to do anime inspired art. If you'd done something else, yeah, yeah, it, you could have done it. It could have been a choice, but to say to say that stuff nowadays doesn't have anime influence, like guess what? We're in a big melting pot. Yeah, of, yeah. of everything right now. The lines are blurring, but I mean, you can take a look at one of my favorite cartoons of all time which is rick and morty that is yeah. definitely an american animated yes. series in terms of the the look of it mm-hmm. the themes the joke that is a, a american yeah. animation you know and and like one of my favorites of the same era is gravity falls mm-hmm. and you will have moments that are anime inspired mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like there's there's an entire episode about him bringing to life uh, a fighting game character, mm-hmm. and the the like, an- not only the anime jokes but the fighting game jokes and the like uh, Akira Kurosawa jokes in there. There's so much; it's hilarious. Um, but the the biggest thing is that like that idea of of not talking down to mm-hmm. uh. A, an audience that you assume is going to be five, six, seven mm-hmm. years old and like also making the show for an older audience at the same time. Yes, there are Western shows that did that, but that hooked a lot of people in anime. That was one of the reasons that a lot of 90s kids looked at anime because they were not being talked down to by this. You know, and, and, But also with the style thing too. It's like mm-hmm. Japanese anime is not just the big eyes, the spiky hair. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just watched, I mentioned on, on, on our Star Wars Resistance uh, trailer review and reaction, like, I just watched uh, uh, In This Corner of the World and uh, Flavors of Youth. And these are, one is set in uh, World War II Japan. Yeah. And it deals with very, you know, serious issues. And then Flavors of Youth is set in, in China and whatnot. And so, and those are not the... Giant eyes, spiky hair, yeah. you know what I mean? Multicolor, you know, costumes. And you know what I mean? Not every not every Japanese anime is yeah. like that. There's different different kinds. And so so if someone sees something, go it's like, oh, well, they don't have that particular stereotype of what a Japanese anime <laughs> is. That doesn't mean that it wasn't anime influence. So speaking of anime influence uh, and things, um, the the game Jump Force. Have uh-huh. you seen much about uh, about this? Yes. Um, so they confirmed uh, the Hunter X Hunter anime characters are going to be uh, in the game as well, and they're like th- just the the animation style in this. After seeing uh, like Fighter Z uh, and things like that, uh-huh. being able to see another three D uh, fighter. I'm interested in it. I had a conversation with uh, a, a fighting game aficionado a while back, a couple of co- podcasts back before Evo. Uh, Matt Lewis came in, and I asked him uh, how he felt about Jump Force, uh, and he was kind of lukewarm on oh, it. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was from like a gameplay standpoint. Well, I, his his reasoning and and for a real deep dive into like how 
the fighting game community may feel about this, go listen to that episode because it's he he is knowledgeable. He is a knowledgeable guy. But for the most part, it was the idea that like when you get into this like uh, 3D fighters. Uh, where you've got free roam and stuff yeah, like yeah. that, they start to really all feel the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, they start to feel like, like nothing feels fresh about them. Uh, whereas with the 2D fighters, uh, the community likes the the variants in there a lot a lot more. Mm-hmm. Even though you'd think that like the 3D one would have more, right? But it's it's more about like once you get into the 3D, it's like you can do anything, and now you do the same thing. Uh-huh. Whereas when you're in the limitations of creating a 2D game, you're like, you're really thinking about how I can make it different. Yeah. Uh, I suppose that's 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 how it ends up happening. Yeah, I, but, I mean, uh, for me, my you know, I don't play as many. I, I used to fighting games used to be my favorite yeah. game, which started with Street Fighter Two, and then went on like my favorite 3D fighter was Virtual Fighter Two. Okay, and that was like you know. But that wasn't like super crazy, right? Like that wasn't yeah. like people flying up in the air and doing multiple. Like it was like an actual like, hey, this is a one on one combat, and you yeah. got to know like to block and to you know what I mean. Like, I guess maybe like my my nostalgia and love for fighting games resides more with a kind of a simpler in terms yeah. of like not too over the top. I mean, obviously Street Fighter had its over the topness as well, but nothing like you know today where it's like. Yeah multi combo combo hits of like 50 or you know what i mean yeah i mean and i'll i'll pick up a franchise that i'm interested in like you know when when fighter z came out i'm interested in dragon ball i'll pick that up um super smash i'll always pick up uh but that's kind of an outlier when yes. it comes to fighting games um but uh yeah well there's so much depth to the uh the fighting game community it's it's insane yeah i I, I haven't played anything past, I would say, Marvel versus Capcom 2 or something like that. That's still a classic. That's still a classic. You know, you find that in arcades, and everyone's yeah. like, okay, I've got my three mains that I, I'm going to put I together. like the tag team aspect yeah. of it, like being able to have two different characters and tagging them mm-hmm. in and out. I mean, it was fun. Um, yeah. All right, last story before we go. Okay. It's, a, it's not, like, about a particular game. It's more about how we purchase games. So Amazon, which, you know, I, you know, I'm a big fan of. I yeah. buy a lot of stuff on Amazon. I currently uh going to Whole Foods to using my Amazon Prime discount there. Yeah. Um they are discontinuing their 20% pre-order online. They okay. are there's still a discount, but it's much much different. So instead of the 20% off, which I think Works out to twelve dollars because most games are, are sixty, or 60. Bucks, right? Yeah, they're replacing it with a ten dollar Prime member credit on selected games. Okay. So they're not giving you money off; they're giving you ten dollars credit. You got to be a Prime member, and it's only on select games. What's your take on it? Like, are you first of all, are you buying? And this is for physical games, right? Are you buying games physically anymore? Are you only digital? I'm I'm a mix of both. I, I sometimes yeah, I'm I'll buy a mix of both. Okay. So Do I you buy any games on Amazon. I don't buy games on Amazon. Okay. If I'm and gonna why, and why not? If I'm gonna buy a physical game, I'll usually go. If I'm gonna go buy a game at all, it's usually because I want to play it that day. Okay. Uh. So and which is why most people or not most people, a lot of people buy digital because. Because then you can get it that day. You can and even then, like download ahead of time, and then yes. it activates. I'm I am I, still not a big fan of pre-orders. Okay. I know we will. You and I will talk about you know collectors editions and special editions yes. and things like that before they're out. But that doesn't mean that I want to pay for them before they're out. Um, so I, I think every time I've picked up a physical game mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, I have gotten in my car, gone to Best Buy, grabbed the game. And come home. Uh, if I've purchased it as a digital copy, it's because I have the room on my hard drive. Uh, to I have like no room on my hard drive yeah. anymore. The I mean the 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 biggest thing for me is like my wife and I both play video games. Uh, she has like I have my PS4, uh, and then she's got uh, hers at the other TV. Mm-hmm. I'm only a little mad that hers is a PS4 Pro and mine's a normal PS4, 
but she's got the 4K TV, uh-huh. so it's it's okay. I'm not bitter. It's fine. <laughs> um, but one of the main things is like if we want to play back and forth, like you know, if we don't want to buy two copies of the game, yeah, yeah, it's easier for us to get the disc and and give it back and forth and things like that. And like for for us, when we bought a copy, one of the very first things that we did uh, here to start doing games coverage was we got a copy of Detroit uh, mm-hmm. Become Human. If we had gotten a, like a download code for that or if we had bought it digitally mm-hmm. or anything like that, not as many people could have played it because I played through it and then I think I gave it to you yeah. for a little bit and you got to play a little bit of it or Frank, no, uh, no, Frank got to yeah. play it and now Mark has it. I think Mark has been playing it ever since. Um, so with a code, we wouldn't have been able to do that or with a with the digital, you're download. never gonna see that Detroit copy again. Oh, you I'm never gonna that. see it again. I I, I I think I loaned Mark a, a mouse like maybe a year and a half ago. I feel like I, I, I have not seen it since. I feel like I need to come up with a video that ha- about an Easter egg in Detroit uh-huh. that I'm like I just need I need the copy so I can record it and uh-huh. take it take yeah. it back. I, I'm sure it's it's sitting at his house somewhere. Right oh yeah, now. absolutely. I mean he's he's told me that he's been playing through it. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but but you know he's been distracted by Madden yes. and Battle for Azeroth, uh, and there's just you know there's and always a new game coming out. So yeah, so my feelings on this is like this doesn't hurt me that much because I buy so much stuff on Amazon. That's kind of why like mm-hmm. uh, you're a prime you're a prime yeah member. I'm a prime member, and that's why like you know I I actually used to not, but now that Amazon had purchased Whole Foods, I go to Whole Foods now because you get a discount if you're right. a prime member. So it's it's one of those things, you know, where like in you you if you get the prime credit card, you get rewards back. You don't get cash back, but you get rewards back. So if you know that you're gonna spend that money anyways, mm-hmm. which I do. Right, right. So to me, the ten dollar member credit versus twelve dollar cash discount, my only beef with it is it's now two dollars less. Less. And it's only versus on- versus and it's only on select yes, games. Yes, in that it's on select games. So that's my bigger beef with it than the than the actual like okay, it's now a uh, member credit mm-hmm. versus cash. Back. Yeah. So what how do you where do you stand on pre-orders in general? If like okay, UFC 3. I just bought that digitally. I just yeah. like, you know what? I'm not going to order. I want to play it right now. It's not a game, you know, sports games, they come every year. Yeah. Uh, it's like, but for the special games, right? Mm-hmm. Like Fallout or uh, Mass Effect. Uh, I, I purchased a, a copy of uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The yeah. games that I feel like are these big event ones, I kind of like to just have the physical copy. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because yeah. I'm old school or whatever. I just feel like I need to have that physical. But if it's a game that I just feel like, yeah, I just want to play it, it's fine. I'll just, you know, download it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it's like a, a game that's on sale in the Microsoft Xbox store. It's like, okay, I'll just buy it and download it and whatever. But if it's like a game that it's like, okay, I'm going to buy it day one and it's a big deal, for some reason I want the physical copy. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I am like... I was a big pre-orderer, mm-hmm. especially in the days when I would like go down to GameStop all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it used to be this almost like this currency exchange thing, where you'd pre-order a game, say you fully paid it, you know, had you sixty bucks on it, uh, and then you know that game was like six months away, yeah, or something like that. Occasionally, I would go down to GameStop and find a game that I really wanted. And it was like a, it was an older game, and it's twenty bucks. And I'd be like, I don't have to pay for this. I will just take forty dollars off of my pre-order ah. and buy this. So it was like, it was like a, uh, it was like a credit system. It wasn't applied to a specific game. It was fluid, and that was one of the things that I liked about GameStop. And I don't know how they attributed the cash to certain things when they were doing that, because mm-hmm. that's the biggest reason that. Um, people are against uh pre-orders is that like you know companies are getting the money early and they're they're enticing you to yeah. i mean that's why to, they have discounts and also extra yeah. items because they want extra- the money the, they want the money sooner but they also want a gauge on on interest yeah. um and so they kind of incentivize you 
by adding extra stuff if you pre-order, but it's not really adding extra stuff. It's taking away stuff from the main game so that it's only available for pre-order people. But, yeah. you know, you you can argue what they would have uh, put into the game versus what they wouldn't have. You know, we can argue that till the end yeah. of time. Ultimately, if if there's any kind of controversy that, like, that, that's that, you know, it's got that much energy behind it, what what are you gaining by pre-ordering it? Well, There's not going to be a shortage on day, especially in the world of digital downloads. Yes, not like, in digital downloads. And like, yeah, it's a different time now. It makes no it makes no sense to pre-order something nowadays if you're not getting anything mm -hmm. uh, special for it. If you now, if you pre-order uh, Fallout seventy six, I know I'm trying to get the 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 beta access right right if you pre-order uh fallout 76 on amazon they give you a beta code oh, okay as an incentive see, see? There like you go. that's the thing like yeah yeah all right but then so that then you can in, in essence play it early right yeah and because they know there's, you because they know you because they got your money right so they know you have it they're just going to give you early access to it and then at the same time they get to get the information of you playing online and, and working out the bugs also i can say that there are plenty of games that i played that i signed up for the beta on you know and and before we started collider games before i like had any kind of like uh pr or or dev access or anything like that i would sign up for the open betas yeah and play the game in the open beta either like the game but not like it enough to buy it mm. or not like the game and thank god i played it in the beta because i realized i didn't like the game and you know they probably lost my money yeah. because they put the beta out. So this is where they already got your money. They already got it. Yeah. So they know it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. They already got your your sixty bucks or more. And so yeah. if you play in the beta and you don't like it, doesn't matter to them. Yeah. <laughs> they like yeah. I would have uh, I would have absolutely brought bought the uh, the the crew too uh -huh. if I hadn't played uh, both the beta, open beta and closed beta and they were both shit. So, yeah. I mean, I would have sunk some money into that and I would have been disappointed. Um, but, but I'm glad I'm glad yeah, that uh, sometimes like I I remember this is a long time ago. This is like when I first like moved down. Yeah. Uh, to LA. What, what what year did the first Xbox come out? Oh, was God. Was it 2000, 2001? Um, it was around that time. Yeah, that sounds about right. I worked at like an a, a Xbox event where I was just like a volunteer. Not a volunteer. I was getting paid. But it was like two days of just helping. Like they had a display at Universal Studios mm -hmm. uh, the city at CityWalk. And just they had a huge display that people would come in and play the games or whatever. Yeah. And... You know, at that time, I had a Dreamcast. You know, I had no plans on buying any new system. And, but it was funny because part of our job, which, you know, sounds cool, is like we would play the games or show kids or other people how to play the games or whatever. Yeah. Played Halo. Oh, yeah. And okay. Got hooked on it immediately. And I ended up taking the money I earned from working that event to buy an xbox and halo one you know what i mean so they yeah. got me there right they, they, like they i played you. the game loved it and then ended up just buying an xbox and that game so do you think that if we switched from them using pre-orders to to hook people if we switched to a world where they used betas like they they opened the open beta up a lot more and they did it like you, you remember like playstation magazine used to have the demo discs yeah 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 like what if we got into a world where demos happened like that like where, where, where we weren't gauging the market by pre-orders anymore we were gauging it by demos and betas uh and it would mean that th this is an amazing world guys this would be a world where everyone gets to play every game at least for a little bit and if you really like it and you want to play it with other people, and you know they hold back some things in the beta yeah. that will be in the the final yeah, game. I'm just trying to think, like I yeah, they used to have that for Xbox too, the Xbox magazine. They have demos on the disc. I'm just trying to think, was there ever a time I played a demo, and then went and bought the game? I'm not sure. I, I can't remember if I ever did that. 
Yeah, but I think, I mean, I I definitely can't say that I ever did because I got those demos because I was a poor kid. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, like I could buy a game for like, what, $40 or $50 at the time, or I could buy a magazine for like $10 mm-hmm. and have like the, the, the disc versions were like $10. The regular magazine was like three, two, something like that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, then you would have like five games. And sure, you can only play a little bit of it, but I would just like repeat that level over and over or, you know, like play as much as like that five minute yeah. timer would let me. And, you know, like that seemed like the better investment for me when I was a kid. Mm. So I can't say that I've ever bought a game based on uh, a, a demo, demo like that, like a demo disc, but I've definitely bought games based on the betas. Okay. It's, yeah, interesting. And go on another, another tangent with kind of all the pre-orders. This kind of falls into the whole uh, movie openings as well because mm-hmm. nowadays that kind of lining up for like a release of a movie yeah. or a release of a video game, which I used to do. I, I remember waiting at uh, – I was still in college, so I went to the uh, – like what was it, electronic boutique? Yep. Waiting there to get the Dreamcast, you know, waiting in a long line and buying the the system and getting the games and bring it back to yeah to my apartment, having my friends come over and play it. Like, and now this is happening with movies because they used to be all midnight movies. Now they're open at like seven. It's just not the same anymore. Do you miss that at all? Did, or did you ever participate in that? Because there- that was a huge part of. I, w- I went video to, games and movies for me. I went to a couple midnight releases, okay. not not of games that were big enough that that I felt like I needed to be there. Like I could have gone eight a.m. the next day and still gotten the game. The one that I definitely remember, and I think this is specifically a West Coast thing, was there was whether this was manufactured or not, there was a shortage of deliveries for Nintendo Wii's <laughs> on the West Coast. Uh, to the point where stores would only be getting two or three mm-hmm. at a time every other day. Yeah. And what would happen is you'd find out that that one store was was getting them and you'd get you'd go over to the store and see like four or five people in line at the mm-hmm. store and go, okay, they're gonna get there's only gonna be three of them. you're not gonna get one. And, and like maybe you'd take the chance mm-hmm. and wait there. Um, and someone at the store would be like, no, sorry, we don't have any more, but here's when the next shipment is coming. So people would have this information and my, like I have three younger brothers. We all went to different stores and we were trying for weeks to get a, well, probably not weeks because I don't think the, the delay was that much, but at least a week, week and a half Mm -hmm. of every day trying to get a Nintendo Wii and like almost having one and like realizing we'd done all this work and and then being like, well, but we barely have the money to do it. Uh, and like, I, I think we had a point where we had one in our hands and we had gone to like McDonald's uh, because we were waiting for so long and we did not have the cash. Like it was, it was a tragic story. But my parents uh, went on a flight to New York uh-huh. and they were like, um, they, they were at a store there and there was just a wall of Nintendo Wii's. So they bought one in New York. And they're just like, you said these were hard to get. Like, they're, what? How is this happening? So I don't know. Like, I heard at the time, and again, I was like, I was much younger at the time. I was not doing research. Um, so I heard at the time that it was a uh, shortage across the entire West Coast. Uh-huh. It could have just been, you know, Santa Clarita, mm-hmm. Valencia, LA area. It could have been a manufactured thing mm-hmm. to like build up hype, but I don't know why they would have only done it on the West Coast. Yeah. But uh, yeah, apparently on the East Coast, they were easy to get. Or maybe West Coast people were just more into the Wii. It than, could than... very well be. But no, no, because the shipments were so low. Okay. The shipments weren't like 20, 30 units, and then people were grabbing them all. The shipments were two or three units. Yeah. Hmm. But maybe this is something that pre-orders solve because people know how much... because. You know, a company like Nintendo would know how much interest there is and go, well, shit, if, if we had known that, like, there would be lines for this, we wouldn't have sent yeah. only two or three at a time. Yeah, that's the thing. It's it's weird. I I'm, I don't miss the lines from for, yeah. for both uh, 
opening midnight movies and uh, buying video games. But I do kind of miss the hype that that, yeah. that happened. Like I remember watching Lord of the Rings, or not Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, the last one, at midnight at mm-hmm. Arclight Hollywood in the dome. You know what yeah. I mean? There was yeah, like yeah. this anticipation that's gone now because I, I feel like if you get if you want if you want that nostalgia, you get it a little bit at events like PAX yeah. and E3 and and Gamescom a little bit. Um so like, you know, if you if you want to wait in line to play a video game, have we got the place for you? Jeez. Uh you know, it was even happening at uh at Comic-Con a little bit, you Oh know? yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just uh, yeah, you know, you kind of weigh the like but then, you know, when you get older, you're like, I'm not going to wait in line. It's you not know worth what I mean? it. Yeah. yeah, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. All right. Uh, I think that's it for this episode of Collider Games Podcast. You guys can subscribe on our Collider Games. I think we have the, the, we're on the factory, the Collider factory. Yes. If In the future, I think we, we may spin off. If there's a lot of interest and we, we get more stuff in, we may spin off onto our own podcast feed but for now we are in collider factory but we do have our own youtube channel that's youtube.com slash collider games joey where can people find you you can find me on twitter and instagram joey rasool r-a-s-s-o-o-l and you can also find collider games all over we have uh twitter feed we have facebook page youtube as you mentioned we've got all the social medias now so what's our twitch Twitch is uh, twitch.tv slash Collider Video. Okay. Uh, we're going to start doing some cool stuff there. Maybe not just video games. Maybe we'll fold in some of the uh, Collider Video stuff around the office, uh, stuff on Twitch as well. Whatever you guys want to see, like, long form and live, let us know, and we'll make it happen on Twitch. Yeah. All right, guys, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Think Here or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And, uh, yeah, make sure to come back next week and, and let us know what you think in the comments.